Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 14. And he was casting, and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come to, upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in place. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. Father, often your word talks about things that we don't get or we don't understand or it's not in our experience and so uh, we approach it with some trepidation or disbelief and Lord the things, everything you talk about, everything is real and so we ask Lord that you would condition our hearts to see what you have for us here, to accept everything that you have to tell us, everything that we might find uncomfortable or weird or, because if you talked about it, it matters. Mm. So we ask uh, that you would clear this place of any darkness, any evil forces that have found their way and just clean it clear, but don't let us be like, fill this place, Lord, fill it to overflowing with your spirit. This is your house. And let us all leave here knowing, <coughs> just knowing that we had a tangible, palatable encounter with the living God. And all of this we ask in the beautiful, blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, where have we been? Um, we're looking at a series of events in Jesus' ministry in which he has been demonstrating his authority. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he showed his authority over the kingdom of heaven and the Holy Scriptures. With the centurion's servant, Jesus demonstrated his authority over sickness and the human body. <coughs> With the widow of Nain's son, Jesus demonstrated his authority over life and death. After that, Jesus is confronted by a doubting John the baptizer, and he tells him, look at the works I'm doing, John. Look at the works I'm doing. Search the scriptures, and you will know that I am the Messiah mm -hmm. that you were looking for. Jesus, at this time, is being followed by huge crowds everywhere he goes. The crowds are generally made up of several types of people. Disciples, supporters, people who are there because they want to hear what Jesus has to say. They're either all in or close to being in. Uh, then there are looky-loos. <laughs> There's a carnival going through town. i got to check this out. But, unfortunately, um, there's a large contingent of opponents and naysayers. There seems to be a great deal of confusion and controversy surrounding pretty much everything Jesus does. This confusion is often accompanied by doubt. 
people don't really get what all this means or what it's all supposed to mean. John had doubts because while Jesus is performing all of the miracles and is fulfilling the scriptures written about him, he is not doing other things that the people expected him to do, which was to overthrow Rome and reestablish Israel. Uh, this feeling or doubt is pervasive even among Jesus' disciples. And I believe that this is why John's doubts were handled by Jesus publicly rather than privately. He could have taken John's <coughs> disciples and had a discussion over to the side, but he handled it publicly because he knew the questions that John had were questions that everyone had. He even had to deal with this question right up till the very end. Jesus is on his last day on earth. Before he's about to ascend, the apostles are going, you going to do it now, Jesus? Is this it? Is this when you're going to reestablish Israel? And he's like, no. <laughs> we went through this. <laughs> no, I'm sure he didn't do that. That's the way my brain reads it. So the controversy is being stirred up by Jesus' opponents who question his motivation and authority at every turn. In this passage, it begins with Jesus demonstrating his authority over the spiritual realm. He will face the exact same controversy and confusion that all of his miracles have produced among the crowds. Now, portions of this event are covered in both of the other synoptic gospels. Mark has a very, as often does, truncated account of this. Matthew has a slightly longer account. Um, but Luke's is the most extensive, and so that's where we're going today. So beginning at verse 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. Matthew's account tells us that the man was also blind. He was blind and mute. <coughs> Whether we're comfortable with it or not, demon possession is real. Whenever Jesus does mass healings, there is always a mention of those who are possessed being among those he ministers to. Mm -hmm. It's a thing. Every culture in the world, every single culture in the world, has lore concerning evil spirits and possession. Even if they didn't know it in the context of the Bible or Jesus or Yahweh, Creator God, every culture in the world has tales of this. The book of Luke has 30 plus references to the devil, demons, and evil spirits, many of which deal with possession. And it does not stop with Jesus. We see Paul dealing with the demon-possessed girl of Philippi mm -hmm. in Mas Macedonia. That's in Acts 16, 16 through 19. Um, there's also the wildly hilarious account of demon possession in Acts 19, 13 through 20. The sons of Sceva who attempt to cast out demons in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And the demon says, I, I know that Jesus and I know... Paul, but who are you? And wails on him and sends him all crying, naked and bloody. And, I mean, that is the most heavy metal story in all of the Bible. I mean, I could just... Uh, it's hilarious. There it is. Um, but there's also mention of the devil, demons, and evil spirits in the Old Testament as well. Um, there are multiple times in which we see people influenced and affected by these entities, but I know... And correct me if someone else does. I know of no discussion or mention of actual possession in the sense that we see it during Jesus' ministry in the Old Testament. Yeah. The thing that we should get from Old Testament accounts of the devil and demons and evil spirits was that God is the ultimate authority. None of them did anything outside of him giving them permission to ask, to act, excuse me. Um, for further information, see Job chapter 1. Mm -hmm. The devil himself has to go and ask for permission before he can do anything. While there is no account of demon possession in the Old Testament, it must have happened. Why? 
Why, Carl? Because there was a tradition of exorcism within Jewish culture that predated Jesus by a lot. There were, there are, there was rituals supposedly handed down by Solomon. Um, I can't say from experience or first-hand knowledge um, if this was kosher or not. Um, remember that Solomon was awesome out of the gate, but he seriously faded in the stretch. Um, he got into a lot of bizarre occult practices because he married heathen women, hundreds of them in fact, and they pulled him over to the dark side. Um, if you need a little peek at some of Solomon's dark side, read Ecclesiastes. I mean, that's a guy who's seriously tortured. Um, there are books, and, and now that I've brought it up, there are books out there <clears throat> that purport to contain these teachings of Solomon. All of them are occultic in nature, and I highly recommend you stay away from them. Um, all we actually need to know about these entities and how to deal with them. Amen. All right, but these rituals did exist within Jewish culture. Um, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually contained an exorcism ritual. So we have recorded um, versions of it. According to what I have found in one of the better known rituals, part of the process involved getting the evil entity to reveal its name. And once they had the name, it could then be commanded out. And then you had the weird mystics who would try to command the devil, but uh, all of it involved somehow getting the demon to reveal his name. And that last fact is very germane to our narrative. Um, on some level, these rituals <coughs> were blessed by God. Jesus will in a roundabout way make that clear in a little bit, and I'll point that out. So if this was a thing, that demons could be overpowered and cast out once they are forced to reveal their name, then surely the demons knew about it as well. At least after the first time it happened, I, I mean, you know, they, they talk. For all their shortcomings, the forces of evil are united in their opposition to God. They share information. <clears throat> Jesus will actually make that point in a moment. So they're, they're, they're very well united, and, and, and they're going to share information. So now look at how this man is being afflicted. Mm -hmm. The demon has made the man mute. He can't talk. So how can the demon be forced to reveal his name when he has rendered his host's vocal cords inoperable? Mm -hmm. Very clever. Very clever indeed. To the Jewish mystics who would have practiced these rituals, this man would have been considered beyond help. If we can't get him to say his name, we can't get rid of him. Mm -hmm. That is one of the reasons the people marveled. This man was afflicted beyond any known means of being helped, and Jesus just comes in and And further, Jesus did not have to carry out any prolonged, involved rituals. The demons simply left at his command. Jesus has shown and declared his authority over the kingdom of heaven and demonstrated his authority over sickness, disease, and death. And here, Jesus demonstrates his authority over the spiritual realm as well. I really wanted to think that we were starting new section and and it all just keeps building on top of each other. Jesus is on this crusade to demonstrate that he is, has, carries the authority of mm -hmm. God. Amen. Literally every aspect <coughs> of the created worlds, and I say worlds because there are two there is the natural world where we exist, and there is the spiritual world where God and the host of heaven live and move. And literally all 
that God has created hearkens to the man, to the command of the God man Jesus Christ. Because God the Father has given him authority. It is as shockingly amazing as it is unprecedented, and the people marveled when they saw it happen. Verse 15. But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. When I see a name like Beelzebub, you gotta go, what's up with that? <laughs> Um, Beelzebub, or Baal Zebub, literally means, direct translation, Fly Lord, or Lord of the Flies. It is uh, mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 1. It is the Philistine god of the city of Akron. Now, interesting, the term Baal, and uh, it's often pronounced um, Baal, mm -hmm. but I was in Israel and I was told that it's pronounced Baal. There's two A's. Get over it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of blunt there. <laughs> yeah, they don't. A little bit. They don't, yeah. uh, what we think is rude is really everyday conversation for them. Being like this close to you is it's perfectly all right. I mean, it's the whole spittle thing going on, and it's just. Oh. In America, we believe in personal space. Well, when I come over there, we'll do that. Um, anyways, Baal in the Canaanite language simply means Lord. It's equivalent to the Hebrew word Adon. And we often heard Adonai, and it was interesting when I was figuring when I was looking into this. Adon is Lord. Adonai is my Lord. Here's your Hebrew lesson for the day. <laughs> so in Canaanite culture, the word could refer to any one of the gods that they worshipped. It would seem that for a time, the Israelites would use that word referring to their Lord. Big L Lord, Yahweh. Um, this practice seems to have been dropped when Jezebel introduced the worship of the Baal of Tyre, who was either Melkart or Hadad um, to the Jews of northern of the northern kingdoms in its capital, Samaria. Uh, at, at this point, the Jews who still followed uh, Yahweh considered it wrong to use the same word associated with idol worship for the worship of the true Lord, Yahweh. Now, the main Canaanite lord was Hadad. He was considered the god over fertility, read in weird sexual practices, seasons, <laughs> war. He's the patron of sailors and seagoing merchants, uh, the leader of the Rephium, or ancestral spirits. In later views, he was considered the king of all gods. King of all gods. So I thought the history surrounding this word was fascinating. And when you look at other things in the text of the Bible, it explains and gives new context to the events in which the name Baal is mentioned. For example, um, Asa, the king of Judah, um, is having a hard time with the northern kingdoms. And so he goes to the Syrian king, whose name was Ben-Hadad, and asked for help. Um, now his father's names were Tabrimen and Hezion. So he wasn't named after his fathers. His father, Tabrimen, named him son of the king of the gods. Wow. <laughs> Puts a whole new context on things. Um, and the author here tells us the word Beelzebub at this point in Jewish culture is a term used for the ruler of all demons, which is Satan, which is exactly how Jesus takes it, so we know he agrees. So what, what Tabrimen named his son was son of Satan. Hmm. So the king of Judah, who was still the good guy, went to the son of Satan for help. Yikes. 
<laughs> puts a whole new spin on that story, does it not? Yes. Um, so again, uh, here in this context, at this point in Jewish history, the word Beelzebub is synonymous with Satan. Um, but I, I think it's also a way of pointing out uh, that the, the, the Baals worshipped by the Canaanite people were actually Satan and his demons. Mm -hmm. Another little breadcrumb trail left by Jesus for us to pick up. And <laughs> Matthew and Mark's accounts of this event uh, tell us that it was the Pharisees who make this accusation. So the Pharisees have just accused Jesus of being in league with the devil. I wanted to say, I wanted to say, I'm like, that is about the worst thing they have ever said about you. This is, and actually it's really not. Um, <laughs> um, he's already been accused of heresy and blasphemy against God. This really is just a logical extension of what they're already accusing. Well, if you're not in league with God, you must be in league with the devil. <laughs> Verse 16, others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. Uh, I cannot track down the exact origins of this, but the Jews of this day believed that Satan and his cronies could do miraculous works on the earth but they could do no miracles and had no ability to manipulate things in the heavens, in the skies. Their powers were confined to dirt. Um, and I think it's amazing, just in this passage, how many folklore and, and, and that type, and we've seen it a couple places where the Jewish mindset, and Jesus right up there addressing this gun, no. Um, and I don't know exactly what kind of people, what, what kind of miracle these people were looking for at this point. Do something in the heaven, heaven make the sun go black, or make, make the first star on the left south of Jupiter blink five <laughs> times and then stop five, or, or, you know, twist clouds into balloon animal shapes. I really don't know what they're looking for, but they want him. Give us a sign that proves you're from God. Jesus will actually address this demanding of a sign in detail in a passage that we'll look at in a couple of weeks. So keep this in mind that this is where this started, this demanding of a sign from heaven. Um, this is ludicrous on his face. Uh, just the assertion that demons can't do anything. Paul actually refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2. 2. Where they got this idea, don't know. So a Jewish Jew, a Pharisee, and a scholar of the Torah is indicating that Satan can ma manipulate or has power over the air, uh, which is in the heavens. And actually, we see an event in Jesus' life in which Satan manipulates the weather to try and keep Jesus from making an important appointment. Mm -hmm. Stay tuned for that. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it just amazes me how much folklore, old wives' tale, and misinformation Jesus had to confront on almost a daily basis. Um, and you wonder why. These guys had the oracles of God. God spoke from a mountaintop and gave them Ten Commandments. And none of this really fits into that. And then he gave Moses big <laughs> stones full of stuff and... and they're stuck on old wives' tales in folklore. Verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. <coughs> Apparently, uh, Jesus does not actually hear what they're saying. Um, but his, their thoughts are revealed to them. It says, knowing their thoughts. Um, I always look at this and I go, yeah, of course. Yeah, Jesus knows their thoughts because he's God. But we have to remember in moments like this, he's operating as a man. He has laid down all of that power. The minute he picks it back up and starts reading people's minds or knowing people's thoughts, he's breaking the rules his own rules, but he's breaking the rules. 
because he had to live as a man. And so, when we see something like this, this is God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, telling Jesus, hey, these guys over here, this is what they're thinking. Uh, he, he's being given discernment through the Holy Spirit. Um, don't, we have to be, I have to be careful of not reading in, you know, yeah, of course Jesus could do that because he's God. Oh. And, and I used to do that a lot, and I do it a lot less now, but I have to catch myself. Um, and what he says here is an absolute universal truth. Um, nothing divided against itself can stand. It is logical and can be applied to countless situations in life. Um, an entity that is divided with factions that are working against or trying to undermine the other half, it's, it's going to fall. Um, in the world today, we've seen, I don't know how many churches that get on ideologically different sides and it winds up splitting the denomination. It's, uh, we've seen it with the uh, Anglicans and, and it, it looks like it's going to happen with the Methodists. Um, any entity that's not working towards um, uh, on maybe a, a more personal basis or a, a, the human body if it gets cancer, that's growing inside of it, and, and, and it's using up resources, and it's constantly working against, and eventually it takes out the whole thing, and it dies as well. Working, one part of the body's working just, you know, to sustain itself and breathe, and the other one's just feed me see more, <laughs> and it's just bigger and bigger and bigger, and they have completely opposite goals, and, and sooner or later, the whole body goes down. So this is an absolute universal truth. Uh, and Jesus, hey, you know, what you're saying it just doesn't make sense. Verse 18, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. So Jesus applies logic of what he's just said against what they are saying about him. What you're saying is simply ridiculous. You know it to not be true. It doesn't work anywhere else in the natural world. Why would you think it would work? Satan could oppose himself. And Jesus is... Uh, I love that Jesus uses logic. <coughs> that he actually asks us to take evidence and compare it and use our minds that he gave us to reason things out. It's not, I said this, Done. He actually takes the time to go, I could just tell you, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to explain to you logically why what you're saying is just dumb. <laughs> and I also love that he does it with so much more aplomb than I could. Um, he's so much nicer about it. Verse 19. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And here, Jesus is basically endorsing or at least saying the practice of exorcism exists. Mm -hmm. It happens. Your sons are doing it. Uh, I think that's not specifically their sons, but just other Jewish people are doing it. So on some level, and it's something that we've, don't have real clear understanding of, Jesus endorses the practice of exorcism here within the Jewish community. And if your sons cast out demons by the power of God, and that is the only way it can be done, I just proved that to you, because Satan doesn't <coughs> cast out Satan, then it has to be God. Mm -hmm. Because it is simply illogical to think that Satan would ever help remove one of his own. They're going to judge you. Your sons who are doing this thing, your relatives, your family, your countrymen who are doing this thing, they will stand in judgment of you. I think, um, I think it sounds very formal, but I think what Jesus is saying, or go ask them, and they will tell you exactly how dumb what you just said is. <laughs> That's how I would say it. 
verse 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, uh, our Greek lesson. If here is better translated as since. I looked it up, and the way this word is used, it's if or whether, but in this sense it's used as a <coughs> logical connector, and so since is a better explanation. So, since, but since I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Finger of God. I love that. I just love that idea. Mm -hmm. Finger of God. The clouds part and just the fingers coming down. I think using this term, Jesus is saying at least two things. One, I am doing this. I have the power to call on God to do this thing. And he does it because he's put that authority in me. Two, I think this is a statement of how easy it is for him to accomplish mm -hmm. this thing. Um, the Jewish exorcism rituals were long, complicated, and involved, and you had to do all this stuff. And all I need <laughs> is the finger of God. <laughs> the Bible, uh, especially in, in the Psalms and the Old Testament prophets, talk about I, God says, I'm going to do this with my strong right arm. With my strong right arm. And Jesus is saying that God is so superior, so much stronger than the devil or his demons, that all he needs is a little pinky finger to flick them, <laughs> and they're done. I added that last part about pinky finger. <laughs> know this, Satan is not the equal opposite of God. God and the devil are not yin and yang. Since I cast out demons with the finger of God, then what that means to y'all is the kingdom of God is here. It is a logic statement. Since this is true, that means this must be true. Since I call on the finger of God to do what I ask it to do, and it does it, then God's kingdom has arrived. It was prophesied that the Messiah would be able to call on God for help and whatever he asked would be done. And Jesus is saying right here, right now, I am the Messiah. The kingdom of God has come and that makes me the king of that kingdom, the promised son of David, the son of God. Just like he said to John the baptizer, I am the one. My works show my authority and fulfill the prophecies. Verses 21 and 22. When a strong man, <coughs> fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger man, then he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes him, all his armor <coughs> takes from him, Boy, that from just changes everything. He <laughs> takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. So on, on the surface, this is just simply a statement of fact. That, you know, the stronger he, the weaker he, no matter how much strong they might be, if you're but below the surface, there's so much more. This is really a parable. The strong man is Satan. He is fully armed and is guarding over his own palace or castle. You might call it a kingdom. And Satan's palace, Satan's kingdom, Satan's place is this world. God created this world and gave it to man. But when man fell, the title deed and thus rule over this world was handed over to the devil. Thanks. And isn't that what the voice said? The eat or not eat the lone forbidden tree. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what that voice was saying? Will I follow God's rule or Satan's rule? 
I'm going to do what my father asked me to do. I'm going to do what the devil's tempting me to do. That was really the choice that was made that fateful day in the garden. Who, uh, who will I let be Lord over my world? Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, Is God a liar? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruits and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he ate. Eve thought that that tree would make her wise like God, knowing good from evil. They thought they were striking out on their own, free from God's stupid, silly rules. Mm -hmm. But that is not what happened. They traded a heavenly king, their creator who lovingly brought them to life when he breathed his own spirit into them. They traded that for slavery to a wicked king who only wants to see their destruction. And this wicked king does not give a hoot about them. He does not care for, or even about them. You get that? Satan really doesn't even care about us. We're a means to an end for him. The devil hates God. And getting us to turn away from God isn't about it's about hurting God. God loves us and the devil knows it. And anyone he can turn away from God, he knows it's another stab in the heart. We're just a means to an end for the devil. Man started out as the sons and daughters of a king and traded it away to be slaves to their own destruction. And the Bible tells us that Satan is the prince of this world. Most pointedly, we hear it in an interaction between Jesus and Satan during Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. Luke 4, 5 through 8. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Notice, Jesus rebukes Satan for asking him to worship him, but he does not dispute the claim that came before that. He in no way says, uh, that's not yours to give. That's not... Jesus, by his ascent, agrees with what Satan had to say. This world is in the hands of Satan. Satan is the strong man, and this world is his palace. So, that's one, 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 per, one player in this cast. The second one is the stronger than he the stronger than the strong man is Jesus. This is the point Jesus just made. All he needs is a finger of God to defeat Satan, to cast him out of his stronghold. He is so much stronger. All I need. <laughs> now, um, armor. In the Greek is the word panoplia, meaning full armor, complete armor, includes shield, sword, lance, helmet, 
greaves, and breastplate. The whole kit and caboodle. The coming of Jesus has stripped the devil of all of his defenses and his weapons. Sword, spear, weapons. The devil is stripped bare. The roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, has been spayed, neutered, declawed, and his teeth have been busted out of his mouth. Yeah, that's where it's coming from. Jesus is coming, has made Satan a paper tiger. And with the devil's defeat, Jesus is plundering his house. All the kingdoms of the earth and thus the citizens of those kingdoms were Satan's possession. And now all who wish to come to Jesus and hail him as king are being ripped from Satan's grasp. Mm. And there isn't a darn thing he can do about it. He is absolutely incapable of resisting because Jesus has whooped him. Verse 23, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. With this statement, Jesus draws the proverbial line in the sand. You are either for me or against me. There simply is no middle ground. There are two choices, the strong man or the stronger than he who has defeated him. You cannot choose, you cannot not choose. There is really actually only one choice, and the choice is Jesus, period. If you do not choose to follow Jesus, by default, by default, you are against him. And I know that's harsh, but I didn't say it. You must choose to follow Jesus. Any other choice, no matter what you call it, neutrality, another path, um, is by Jesus' definition, choosing to follow Satan. And not actively following Satan, not falling in, but you're going to wind up the same place he does. You're part of that crew now, whether you're an active participant or whether you know you're an active, in fact, Jesus is about to make that point. You're, everybody's an active participant. The world wants to condemn Christianity because it is so exclusive. They want to say that there are many paths to God. And we, who are you to say that this person's path is not as good as this person? Jesus. Jesus says that it, that's not true. Um, and if you want to take an issue with uh, Christianity's exclusivity claims, um, your offense is with Jesus and not with Christians. I just follow what the guy told us. And it gets worse. And he who does not gather with me scatters. This is a war and no one is Switzerland. There simply is no neutrality. Everyone is active in this battle. You are either working to gather souls or you are working to scatter them. Think about it. Think about this just for a minute. Everybody has influence over somebody. If you're a parent, you have influence over your children. You have extended family members, close family members. At your work, you have influence. People are watching you, whether you know it or not. Every day, all the time, people are noticing what you're doing. And if they see you following Jesus, or trying to follow Jesus, mm -hmm. hmm, I wonder, I don't know. But if you're not following Jesus, say you're living for sports, or baseball, or your family, or your house, or your yard, or, gee, all these other people don't need Jesus. You're either gathering or you're scattering, whether you know it or not. Amen. Again, not my words. If you don't like this, take it up with Jesus. 
And as I was going through this, it made me think of this song. Um, the uh, rock band Rush, mm -hmm. um, maybe the greatest power trio to ever come out of Canada. Three <laughs> of the most amazing individual <laughs> musicians in the world. Um, uh, and they had this song um, called Free Will. And the lyrics were written by their drummer, who honestly is possibly one of the top five best rock drummers of all time. This guy's drum kit could fill any half of this room, and he plays them all. I mean, and they're, they're not just for show. This guy's just phenomenal. And uh, the chorus of the song, it, the, the, the song Free Will is all about, um, for lack of a better term, religions, and what people choose to fill their lives, and what people choose to follow, and what their philosophies are. And the chorus goes, um, you can choose a ready guide in some celestial voice. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Mm -hmm. You can choose from phantom fears or kindness that can cure. I will choose a path that's clear. I will choose very well. And, <laughs> and there was part of me back in the day that wanted to uh, latch onto that and, and make it, try and Christianize it and go, oh, God gave us free will. And then I read some articles, and Neil Peart, who's the drummer, and writes most of their lyrics. On his best day, he's an agnostic or a humanist. On his worst days, he's a straight-up atheist. And, and, and this is what passes for the world's philosophy. Mm -hmm. This is what people... I can choose any path as long as I don't hurt anybody else. And, and there's some truth in there. Um, if I choose not to decide, I still have made a choice. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus would agree with that statement wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. But the world is constantly telling us that all roads lead to heaven. And Jesus says, no. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but my me. And there is no neutrality. Mm -hmm. Amen. Verses 24, 25, and 26. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So Jesus... Um, is expounding on the issues surrounding demon possession. Again, there's an idea within Jewish lore uh, that demons, when they are not possessing a body, dwell in the desert. Here called dry places because apparently they're hanging around waiting for a victim, hoping to get some rest from their labors of vehemently opposing God's purposes. Um, who hangs out in the desert? How many people? I'm, is a camel going to come running by and they're going to possess a camel? I, I know, again, another idea that where do these guys get buzzard? Hey, there's there's my ticket. I don't know if Jesus here is assenting to this idea or simply acknowledging that this is the pervasive thought of the day. And not finding a new place to dwell because who's going to, again, who's he going to run across in the desert? Um, everybody's hanging, that's the hat in place. I'm gonna go. So he decides to go back to the place he was kicked out of. I'll see what's happening. And since he has been away, the place has been cleaned up, and put back in order, and it's empty, unoccupied. And thus, he feels it's wide open for him to reoccupy. But, but he remembers... He was once evicted from this place, so he goes and gets a bunch of his rowdy buddies, even more powerfully wicked than himself, assuring that it will be way more difficult to get rid of him this time. Because they'll have to get seven other guys to give up their name before they get to him, right? 
What Jesus is saying here is that simply delivering someone from evil is not enough. We are all empty vessels from birth, an empty vessel. We are meant to be filled with something. What we choose to fill ourselves with is either good or evil. The most extreme extreme form of being filled with evil would be demon possession. And simply casting that out and cleaning up the place is not enough because the evil will come back after a time stronger than ever and you will be far worse off than before. When evil is cast out, that space must be filled by God, by Jesus, or the evil will walk right back in the door and bring rowdy friends. Mm -hmm. We cannot simply deliver possessed people from the evil that has taken residence inside of them. We must replace the evil with the goodness of Jesus. That is the only thing that can keep the demon from returning. And this is true. I have personally seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of you may know, some of you may not know. Um, I used to be a practicing alcoholic. Um, 25 years um, clean by the grace of God. And um, I have watched so many people get put into rehabs and get cleaned up. I've seen people come to meetings for a little while and they haven't been drinking for two months or three months or six months. And they do nothing to fill that hole. Mm-hmm. It's a spe- and, and I think when alcohol or drugs get excited, they just rip that hole just a lot bigger. They just push out and make room and expand and add on a wing and dig a basement. <laughs> and, and when it's gone, you're really empty. Maybe more empty than you can imagine. And if they don't fill that with Jesus, I just watch them go back over and over and over and over again, the people who make it out of drug addiction, who make it out of alcoholism, are people who get Jesus, who get mm-hmm. God. We can't just simply clean house and think everything's going to be okay. That hole has to be filled with something. Well, Jesus is talking specifically about those who are demon-possessed. When you look at this, in the light of Jesus' statement just before this, he who is not with me is against me. This has a much wider implication that applies to everyone. Again, we are all empty vessels. Anything that we fill ourselves with in place of God, no matter how good and virtuous it may appear, is in fact evil. Eeps. Yeah. Gold. Um, You are either for Jesus or you are against him. You either allow Jesus to fill you or anything else you allow to fill you is not God and therefore is evil. And I, I, I heard one of my favorite teachers go a rich man who takes all of his wealth and builds a children's hospital and sets up funds so that no child ever has to pay to come they can come and get cured of cancer in the family and if he doesn't do it for the glory of God it's evil Mm -hmm. and I choked on that (laughs) I choked on that And then uh, God spoke to me. <laughs> he said, He's right. You need to get with this. And you, you start looking at it. And anything, you're either gathering or scattering. So if I did this because I'm benevolent and I'm an awesome guy. Then people start thinking, just be benevolent and an awesome guy and I'm, I'm good. 
But when he says, I did this for the glory of God because of all the blessings he's given to me. Amen. He's gathering. I had to wrap myself or my brain around how someone could do something so amazing and it be evil. And this passage kind of explained it to me. You're either gathering or you're scattering. And who we advertise for, mm -hmm. we're either scattering or gathering. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yeah. It sounds incredibly harsh. And in our, our pluralistic society today, <laughs> we'd have me in a hammer lock, a headlock and beat me in the head. For the, I'd go to jail for saying something like that. <clears throat> but if you believe Jesus is who he says he is, mm -hmm. the creator, God, Yahweh, who has come to tabernacle amongst us, then everything he says is right and true. Mm -hmm. So I need to take Jesus at his word here, search the scriptures, and pray fervently asking God how to work this out in my life. So, kind of wrap up. Satan and demons, the fallen angels, are real. Satan is the ruler of this world. But Jesus came and defeated the strong man. Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the dead took the roaring liar and neutered, declawed, shaved him bare and broke his teeth. He's a defeated foe. Mm -hmm. Jesus paid the price to redeem the earth back from the devil. And when the time is right, he will take possession once again and reign over the earth as Savior and King forever. Mm -hmm. The devil knows he is defeated and that his reign over the earth is coming to an end. His plan, in the meantime, scorched earth. If he has to give it up, he plans to hand over nothing but ashes. But even as he seeks to destroy everything he can between now and then, there is hope. Mm -hmm. Jesus is plundering the devil's possessions. He is doing that by calling to all men, follow me. Make me Lord of your life and gather with me. Mm -hmm. That is the only choice that leads to life. Not choosing me is a choice that will lead to destruction. If you are not yet following Jesus, I beg you, do so now. Jesus could return at any moment, and once he returns to take possession of the earth, it will be too late. Today is the day of salvation for none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. If you are for Jesus, then you have a task. Be gathering with him. We need to be sharing this message with everyone we can. Gathering with our Lord is a privilege. He doesn't need our help, you know that. He, he can just do it all. He's got angels that actually listen to him. And <laughs> he doesn't need us. He lets us help him. And then he rewards us as if we did it. It's like that little five-year-old kid out in the garage with his dad and he's handing him, he handed him a wrench and a rag. And he goes in the house and says, Mom, we fixed the car. And she gives him a cookie. It's a lot like that. Dad's just standing by him, smiling ear to ear. It is a get to, not a have to. The battle line has been drawn. Jesus says, fall in with me, or by default, you're on the side that's already 